What's your biggest failure, Stephen? I've done everything wrong. In a sense, my career has been a noble failure. Chris Martin is an example of someone who really loves to be at the center of the universe. The last album was his great artistic statement. Even that sounded a bit contrived. I do have a frustration that perhaps Radiohead got away with a lot of stuff that Porky Pantry and, and, and myself and my solo career don't seem to have got away with. It's essentially making very obviously conceptual rock music. Things that the mainstream media traditionally sometimes have taken the piss out of. Welcome to Disruptors. I'm Rob Moore, and on the show we have the king of progressive rock. It is official, Google it, Stephen Wilson. It surprised me, but Stephen holds nothing back talking about Radiohead, Muse, Chris Martin, and Coldplay. How the music industry has radically changed over the last 30 years. He talks about why he left the band Porcupine Tree, why he reformed, and the uncertain future of pop music. Oh, and I'm a massive fan, so you'll probably see a side to me you've not seen before. But before we dive in, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. Stephen, are you the most underrated musician ever? I think I come from a tradition of people that have operated um, outside of the mainstream and kind of reveled in that. So in the sense that if you exist outside of the mainstream, then you're, you're not beholden to this kind of issue and problem of coming up with hits. You know, I don't have any hits. You know, one of the reasons I'm, you know, fortunate that when I go on tour with my band, whether it's Porky Pantry or one of my solo tours, is I can actually play whatever I want because I don't have anything that people are expecting me to play. Right. So although I would be the first to admit that that has also had a downside, I mean, I've been frustrated over the years that I don't, you know, I can't get in a taxi with a taxi driver and say, oh, you, so what do you do? So I'm in the music business. Oh, anything I'll have heard of? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think so many of my friends, like even my friend Nick Beggs from, uh, from my, band, my solo band, Kajagoogoo, he had this big hit in the 80s, Too Shy. Everyone knows Too Shy, so he can say, oh yeah, I had Too Shy. And, oh, I know that song. I don't have anything like that. But I think over the years, I've also acknowledged to myself that there is a positive side to that. To not be beholden to this kind of um, contract with the devil, if you like, that you, you are expected to come up with hits. So what I, what I, my career kind of has existed outside of the mainstream. I'm what you would call the quintessential cult artist in the sense that I have a large audience, very flatteringly I have a large audience, very gratifyingly I have a large audience who kind of expect the unexpected. And I don't underestimate how privileged I am to be able to say that. I can essentially do whatever I want. And the fans, they might complain, they might not like it, but they will give me the benefit of the doubt. They will listen and they will learn to love it or not. And I realized that actually that is something quite unusual. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. I'm sure there are people that are much more talented than me that are even less known than me. But certainly I would fit into that definition of a cult artist here. Yeah. Mm. Well, I've got my own answer to that okay. question. I think you are the most underrated musician ever. Well, thank you. I think. <laughs> I think, yeah. Is that, I mean, is that underrated? I mean, that's... Or, or maybe your talent's not known by enough people. Maybe that's a different way of saying it. Yeah, and obviously I've always felt that. You know, there's always been a part of me that's been frustrated that the music, to me, has never felt like it was particularly difficult or willfully obscure or willfully uncommercial. There's something about, not all of my songs, but some of the songs are quite, I think they're quite accessible. Mm. And yet radio has never played them because they've decided for whatever reason, I'm the guy that does prog rock or whatever it is, whatever their preconception is of me, it's excluded the possibility to get my songs played on the radio, to get on t British TV or TV anywhere in the world. So I've kind of existed outside of, of the conventional, the traditional media exposure that you expect to get if you're an artist that has accessible music. I've never had the benefits of that. And that has been really frustrating. I mean, I'll be very honest with you. I have been very frustrated by that. Now, the reason I say that is, of course, that for some people, it's almost a dirty word to say that you success, you aspire to be successful. And I do in a way. 
I fell in love, you know, when I was a kid, I fell in love with, you know, pop stars like Prince. Prince was my idol. I wanted to be Prince, you know, notwithstanding the fact I didn't have any, anywhere near his talent or charisma. But the idea, the magic of the pop star, the pop icon, I completely fell for that. I wanted to be a pop star, but I didn't want to be a pop star at any cost. I wanted to be a pop star with integrity, as Prince, you know, had integrity. So to come up, to come time and time again, to come up against that kind of brick wall of not being able to get on the radio, not being able to get on the TV, that I always thought lesser bands seemed to be able to negotiate that with relative ease. And I just, for whatever reason, never was able to get that kind of exposure. And again, I say that with the caveat that I think there is a, there is a plus side to that. I have my anonymity. Um, I can't imagine what it must be like to be someone that literally cannot go, cannot go out on the street without being recognized and hassled. I don't have that, you know, problem, if you like. But there is always that side of me that felt like the music should have reached more people than it has. And what, and what is music? What is, the, what is the creative process if it's not that kind of wish to touch as many people as possible with what you do and to see yourself reflected back in the mirror of an audience? So in that sense, it has been a frustration too, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get into that a little later. Okay. So um, I was having a little bit of a debate stroke argument with Harry over there. Right. Um, Harry's been helping us with the show for about seven years, and we're both big into music. And I basically said to him that Stephen's the king of progressive rock and Porcupine Tree are better than Radiohead. And I'm a big Radiohead fan. Me too. Um, so that's quite a thing. And Harry was like, nah. No. So do you know what I Googled? <laughs> I Googled right. who is the king of progressive rock. And I just want to show you what comes up. Okay. In yeah. massive black letters, yeah. guitarist Stephen Wilson. Yeah, yeah. How does that make you feel? Well, it's, it, in some ways, it's coming back to what we talked about before. It's obviously simultaneously incredibly flattering, but it's also, it's a reductive kind of version <laughs> of what I do. So... I, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with my whole sprawling back catalogue, which is... Big, massive fan. Okay, so that. I've done yeah. everything from ambient music to electronic Opeth. pop music to extreme metal with <laughs> Opeth to... And obviously I have done a lot of progressive rock and I've worked with a lot of other progressive artists, but I've also worked with pop artists. I've worked with Tears for Fears. I've worked with, you know, The Who. I've just done a mix for... The, so in that sense, this idea that you can reduce a musician to a single kind of sound like the king of progressive rock. To me, that's very flattering, but it's also frustrating because I think it's part of the reason why I have never been played on the radio. And it's part of the reason why I have never been on Later with Jules Holland. I've never been on Later with Jules Holland, for example. That's crazy. You think we every, should campaign that. Well, we you think every British artist pretty much has been on, I mean, how many seasons? 28 seasons yeah. of that. There's virtually no British artist that hasn't been on Later with Jules Holland. Do you, is there a reason for that, do you think? I think it is that preconception that I am the guy that does prog rock. And prog rock is not something we cover in the mainstream. It is a, it is a cult, underground form of music, which is largely true because, of course, if you think about it, the, the tradition of progressive rock is all about the idea of the album. It's not about singles. It's not about three-minute pop songs. Okay, some progressive rock groups over the years had a kind of freak single, you know, whether it's Pink Floyd having another brick in the wall or whatever. But generally, progressive rock artists, and I'm using very broadly now, Led Zeppelin you could include in the idea of progressive rock, hardly even released singles. But the point is that they came through an era when that was, you were able to just be bloody minded about it, say, we're not going to release singles, we're just going to make albums, because this was the 70s, 60s, 70s. This was the era when people were curious about music, we would go to shows. Um, there was only two or three TV channels, you know, and, and so people would discover music in a much more organic way. Now, to really reach a large audience, you have to have so much impact in so many areas, streaming, physical, radio, media. Down, and those things take a lot of clout and a lot of power, which is why it's really the only very sort of commercial pop artist, I think. That when was that? Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you can remember an artist clearly from the tradition of rock music 
breaking through to the mainstream in a big way? Yeah, I can't think past. I would say yeah. you're going... You, I'm, I'm going back late 90s, exactly. 2000s. I can't go beyond like Rage Against the Machine or well, stuff I would, like I that. Well, I would say, if you, even if you broaden out, I would say Coldplay maybe. Rock, you could say Rock. They, started, they started. Them and yeah. Muse started exactly. that way, yeah. I would say Coldplay and Muse. Yeah, true, yeah. To actually break through internationally in a mainstream way as a rock artist, you're talking 20, more than 20 years ago. Could you argue, though, when they became well-known, they weren't really rock anymore? Well, I think they adapted, and mm. that's one of the good things. That's one of the, the, the good things in career terms about someone like Chris Martin is he seems to be very canny. He's very aware of you know the last album having the collaboration with BTS, for example. He's like whatever I can, and Elton John's always been very good at that too. Mm. You know, doing a duet with whoever is the current pop artist. So these guys stay these older sort of statesmen, if you like, stay relevant by adapting. But you're right. Do you think that's selling out to a certain degree? <sighs> It depends on how well, how well you kind of do it, I guess. I mean, someone like David Bowie or Madonna, they were always very good at adapting. And it didn't, it felt like they kept their integrity somehow. So when David Bowie did drum and bass in the mid 90s, it felt somehow like he was still doing it with some integrity or some natural curiosity. It wasn't purely careerist. But I think there's a, there's a degree of cynicism, of course, to adapting to whatever is, you know, flavor of the month in terms of what the radio or the streaming services are focusing on i've never been very good at that and i think one have you tried then well i've tried and then hated myself so i've tried because i've been put under pressure right. by um a record label for example the album's amazing we just need one song we can get on the radio and then that will create this doorway that all these people can walk through and discover your amazing and of course it sounds great when people say that to you Oh yeah, you know, if I can just give people this doorway to walk into my world, they've got this incredible catalogue of, of you, know, you know, really ambitious, creative, whatever, rock music they can explore. But when I've done that, I've always felt a little part of me has been unable to hide the fact that it is a contrivance. I feel like people can hear the lie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I, and because I guess I hear it myself, and I guess that I, I feel like they can hear the there's a slight insincere strand to it. So I've learned from my mistakes not to do that. Is there a song in your catalogue that is that song? Yeah, I mean, for example, on an album called Dead Wing from from 2004 or 2000, uh, sorry, yeah, 2005, I think. Yeah, there was a song called Shallow. Yeah, love that song. I think it's good. W were you being ironic then, calling it Shallow or? No, I wasn't, oh, although... that would have worked well. <laughs> that would have worked, yeah. Um, it's good. It's a okay. great song. It's good. Okay, I'm very happy you think that. <laughs> to me, I just remember the circumstances. We'd written the rest of the album. I'd written the rest of the album. I delivered to the record company. And they said, we can't get any of this played on American. We were signed to an American label at the time. We can't get any of this played on American rock radio. Can't you just go and write something four minutes? You know, which still has the Pork Country DNA. Yeah. And I went away and I created that song Shallow, which to me, it's successful at what it does, but it's not completely sincere in the sense I can hear there is an element of contrivance from, from me. And I cannot unhear that when I hear it. Do you not play it live now then for that We reason? don't play it live. Oh. We haven't played it live since 2000 and that tour. We haven't played it live since that tour. It's just something about it that just felt a little bit too insincere. And, you know, again, this comes back to this idea, and it wasn't a hit anyway, by the way, so it didn't succeed when it was supposed to. And, you know, the one... there's one, And it's called Jello. I love the irony. And it's called yeah. yeah. And, of course, if there's one truism for me, it's this, that if you're going to fail, fail on your own terms. There's nothing worse than failing with something you don't believe in yourself. Mm. I'm sure you must have had mm. other people say similar well, things. maybe not, actually. Okay. But I definitely agree with you. If you're, you know, if you're going to fail, at least fail do some, doing something you completely, you're completely invested in. But how would you have known unless you tried? Well, I did try. And, yeah. and, I, and I felt slightly grubby, <laughs> slightly grubby, <laughs> even though, you know, as you say, I can listen back to it now and say, actually, no, it's pretty good. It's yeah. a pretty good rock and roll song. Yeah. But it was It fits in that album, and, I and think. And it does. And it does fit in your album. And you're right. And actually, it, if argu arguably, it probably gives the album a balance, you know, yeah. in terms of accessibility. But at the time, I felt like I'd been slightly bullied. Bullied is too strong a word, but slightly pushed into doing it for a reason that was not anything to do 
with music. It was to do with marketing. And that, partly because I, I grew up completely obsessed with the magic of music. You know, I think this is one of the things, just before we started recording, I was talking about this idea I have of the music industry. What people perceive to be the music industry is actually two very different industries. There is the music industry and there is also the entertainment industry. And to me, they are two almost, they're two most completely, they can antithesis of each other in the sense that one of those industries is about identifying what people want and giving it to them, entertaining. And the other industry, the music industry for me, real musicians, whether you're talking about, you know, you were talking about Phil Anselmo from Pantera, mm. we're talking about Tom York from Radiohead, real music, oh, someone like Elton John has been able to span the two, but we'll come on to that in a minute, maybe. Um, the real musicians, the ones that you really feel have kind of come into the industry because they have some kind of inner vocation. They're in love with the idea of making music, of being creative, of take, without wishing to sound pretentious, taking something within them and drawing it out. And it is a very, I think, you know, true creation is a very selfish act. You shouldn't be thinking about what somebody else is going to make of what you do. I mean, this is the Van Gogh thing. Van Gogh, who never sold a painting in, during, during his whole life, you know, very sad in a way, but has since obviously gone on to become one of the, you know, the legends of, of the art world. But that idea that he was so self-obsessed and so selfish and self-indulgent, which of course is often used as a very negative, to be self-indulgent seems very negative. But actually there's something very pure about being self-indulgent. I'm making music to please me, not the fans, not you. And if you like it, that's great. And I will do everything I can to help push the music out there once I've made it. But you know what? I'm gonna make it in a vacuum. I'm gonna make it in a completely selfish way. I'm not thinking about what anybody else wants from me, what anybody else, what anybody else expects from me, least of all managers or record companies. And I'm gonna put it out there, and then once I put it out there, I'm very happy to play the games. I'll go on TV, I'll go, on, I'll go and talk on, on podcasts and, and newspapers. I'll do anything I can to market the music as long as the music itself was made in a very selfish way. And I think that is the fundamental difference between the two sides of the music industry. The music industry and the entertainment industry. The latter of which will always say, what do the fans want? What's going to sell the best? Let's contrive to make that, to fill that gap in the market. And I can't, I found I'm very, I'm incapable of thinking in that way. At least if I do think in that way, I start to feel a bit grubby. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Walking away from Porcupine Tree initially for the best part of 12 years because everyone said I was mad and I didn't care. I wanted to work with different musicians. I wanted to be able to hop from genre to genre without being told by my bandmates, we can't do that, we can't do this. This is really fascinating because I've gone on the opposite journey in that I used to be an artist. I've always been into rock, metal, and pure music that never sells out. Um, I loved showbiz by Muse and then progressively disliked them when I felt they became a stadium band. Mm. Loved first album, maybe two of Coldplay, then they progressively became a stadium band. And I was just an artist. I was similar in that I want to do paintings that aren't necessarily commercial. They are an expression of self. This was say 16, 20 years ago. Now I'm an entrepreneur and I teach a lot of people to be entrepreneurs and I don't mind saying I'm, I make really good money out of it. And I think I've learned to accept the fact that for there to be value exchange, there's the producer and the consumer. So is there an argument to challenge what you said by saying an artist whose art is selfish and it doesn't get seen or liked by anyone and it's not for anyone, what is it? Is it not just a vacuum? And are we not here to please people, these people who buy our music? So the counter argument to that, you're absolutely right, of course you are, but the counter argument to that is actually 
If you create something in a very selfish way, if you take your own experiences and you channel them into your music, of course there are other people that will empathize with what you do. Of course there are. None of us are islands in that sense. We all have a kind of shared human consciousness. We all, we all understand you know, what, it's like, what it's like to, you know, um, unrequited love, loss, regret, you know, nostalgia for childhood. Mm. All of these things, which are all things I write about in my music, for example, are kind of universal themes. And if you work in the field of creating melodies, which I do, accessible melodies, then it, of course, again, you're going to, you're go, you are going to find you have an audience. And as I say, I've never been afraid to go out and promote my music on, in the belief that actually what I do is quite accessible. But I think the point is that I don't come at the music from the point of view of what do people expect from me? What do people want from me? And part of the reason for that is that the artists I grew up admiring very much, and I'm sure you admire them too, were the Bowies, the Pink Floyds, the Led Zeppelins, the, Pink, the Beatles, the most successful pop group of all time. You can't look at the Beatles' career trajectory and tell me that they were ever, they hardly ever did the same thing twice for a start. And yet they were able to confront the expectations of their listeners all the time and take them on this journey with them. Now, of course, they were in a position of privilege. They had the power to be able to do that. They were the Beatles, you know. Mm. When you're the Beatles, people listen. Even if they don't necessarily, what the hell, what strawberry feels for her? What the hell are they doing on that? That's not she loves you. But it's the Beatles, so I'm going to listen to it two, three, four, five, six times. Ah, now I get it. Mm. And I think that if you, another, another good example would be someone like Frank Zappa. No one can tell me Frank Zappa ever did anything except to please himself. He was, you talk about disruptors on your show, he's a classic, he's a, he's a contrarian. Completely, and I'm a little bit of a contrarian. One of my philosophies has always been, if I'm not upsetting a big proportion of my fan base with each record, I've probably, I'm not, probably not doing the right thing. Because I believe a lot of what is special about artists like Bowie, Beatles, Floyd, the Zeppelins of this world. And, the, you know, Radiohead, another great example. I mean, mm. Radiohead were poised, let's not forget, Radiohead at one point were poised to be the new U2. Mm. OK, computer, they could easily have become. The, and they took an unbelievable, you know, right turn into the world of electronic music, kept all their integrity and somehow managed to keep most of their audience too, which is a trick. <laughs> that, you know, very few people ever pull that trick off. But I think that idea of being contrary, and maybe this is something that's a little bit unique to the music industry. And one of the reasons why perhaps the music industry, I mean, you may tell me I'm wrong, because obviously you've talked to a lot of people over the years in different fields. Maybe there's something interesting, unique about the music industry in the fact that the idea of confronting expectations of your audience is in a way what potentially can give you a longer career. That if you just keep delivering the same thing. Rammstein do it though. They do. Oh, they're the, I actually really admire them for making the same album 20 times. ACDC. And yeah. How, ACDC. Like, yeah. To a lot of people would say there's yeah. not a skill in that. I think there's a massive skill in that. No, you're right. And there's always the exceptions okay, that prove yeah. the rule. Yeah. And ACDC was the example I was going to get. I yeah. mean, ACDC have made the same album for 45 <laughs> yeah. years or 50 years. And Slayer have, haven't they? Slayer. And they yeah. are one and they are some of the biggest acts in the world. Um, but I wonder if there are as many people. I mean, let, let's, let's take a band like Slayer, for example. Slayer is a great example. To me, Slayer created the definitive record almost 40 years ago, Rain in Blood, one of the greatest, if not the greatest thrash metal album ever made. In a sense, everything else they've ever done, I could argue, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, everything else they've ever done was superfluous. And that actually- Seasons in the Abyss, come okay. on. All right. Come on. Okay. Everything after season, okay. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? The point is that at that point, their reputation was kind of immortal and they could have gone out and toured for the next right. 50 years yeah. on the basis okay. of rain in blood there's a there's an argument to say that metallica have done the same thing you know mm. really they haven't made an album that their fans have really liked since the black album or master of puppets and yet they remain one of the biggest bands in the world ramstein the same i don't think their current record for example would have sold anywhere near no. what an album 2020 it's a lot softer isn't it 
Yeah. But essentially, you're right. It's the same. Mm. They, they've got this formula. But I think it is the law of diminishing returns. If you make the same album, I think you can sustain your life following. People will always want to go and see Rammstein because they've got one of the best mm. live shows in the world. But people will sort of think to themselves, I don't really need to buy that new album, do I? Because it's, it's the same with ACDC. I don't suppose anyone, you know, they're never going to have the same songs that Back in Black had because essentially they're still playing that same furrow. Um, Isn't the other side of that, though? Everyone's waiting for the next in absentia with you or OK Computer with Radiohead. Once you've made something so seminal, a lot of the fans want another rehash of that, don't they? You're right. I, like, I, I'll just say it because I just want to. I am a massive fan of your work. I always like meet a lot of my fans on this show and I never really know how to say it. I always think you should just say it and be honest. So I have listened to everything you've done and there is always a part of me that wants to hear a bit of an absentia again and I, like, I hate myself for that because no, no, I, I like the expression you're going on I'm the same with artists I like too of course I am a part of me is always wanting I think the point is that you when you fall in love with a particular artist or a particular band there's a door that you walk through into their world and it could be in the case of Porcupine Tree a lot of people walk through the door the in absentia door it was our first album on a major label. It was our first album on an American label. We had a good promotional budget behind us. It was a great record and recorded very beautifully in a mm. good studio. A lot of people discovered us through that record. So they walked into our world. When you walk through a door into somebody's world, there is a sense that nothing else will ever quite live up to that ever again. Mm. It's like first kiss. Yeah, first love. I was going to say that. Love. Yeah. It's first love. And you... And in a sense, what's, what a great artist will do, or, or, a, or a willful artist will do in a way, is kind of recognize and acknowledge that. That I, will, I can never give you, I can ne as you as the listener, I can never give you what you want ever again. You could really. give us a bit though, couldn't you? <laughs> but what I would rather do is confront your expectation and give you something completely different that initially you say, I'm not sure about this. But it's Stephen Wilson or it's Porcupine Tree. So I'm mm. going to give it the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to yeah. listen a little. And you might not ever like it as much as in absentia, but you at least, you might get something else out of it. Um, this is the, all I can say is this is the way it's worked with me, mm. with the artists I really love over the years. Whether it's, you know, another great example would be Neil Young. Neil Young, who goes from making, country, you know, country-tinged acoustic albums to making full-on grunge albums with Crazy Horse to making albums where all the vocals are through a vocoder. He's done every, I mean, he's, he's done it to the, in fact, you should try and interview him. He got sued by his own record label. You know that story? No, I don't. I, I, I became more aware of him when he went after Joe Rogan, but. Well, so in mm. the 80s, he got signed by Geffen. David Geffen signed him yeah. for a huge amount of money. He released a series of albums that resulted in David Geffen suing him for not making it, I forget the exact, the exact <laughs> wording of the lawsuit, but it was like making albums that sounded insufficiently like Neil Young. <laughs> this makes me want to interview him even more. Um, I think he'd be an amazing so Because basically he I'm ended, write that down. He ended yeah. up making a, um, what is it? He, delivered, he did a rockabilly album. He followed that with an album where all the vocals were through a vocoder, like electronic. He then followed that with a country and western album. And of course, this is not what Neil Young. <laughs> this is not what Neil Young fans. It's certainly not what you expect when you just signed Neil Young and paid him X million dollars. And and Geffen ended up suing Neil Young for making records that sounded insufficiently like Neil Young. There you go. That I mean, that's confrontational. Mm. And I've all. I is guess, that not too much of a fuck you to your fan base, though? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, but I think. I think those things. Because I'm a bit of a contrarian, I've always loved those stories, you know, like Lou Reed delivering to us. I mean, Lou Reed having his big hit with um, Transformer in the 70s and following, it up, following, up, following up, delivering that to RCA, the follow-up album, Four Sides of Guitar Feedback, an album called Metal Machine Music. Another very famous story from the music industry of a classic, fuck you, from an artist to his record label. Because they basically said to Lou, Oh, you've had this big hit, Walk on the Wild Side. What, give us more of them, Lou. Yeah. Give us a whole album of Walk on the Wild, Wild Side. And of course, that's kind of what the fans might have wanted and expected too. But Lou, being contrary, famously so, delivered four albums of guitar feedback and said to RCA, right, fuck you, release that as my follow-up record. <laughs> Did you hear the story of KLF? 
when they were invited to play at the Brits and they got a heavy metal band and they played 3AM Eternal through a death metal I band. didn't know that. Yeah, their um, documentary just came out. I was a big fan of those when yeah, I was a yeah, kid. Yeah. Every time people expected him to do something, he went somewhere. Well, he went Bill, down fuck you lane. That was Bill Drummond, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, I know the stories about them burning a million pounds. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, but, you know, the, the, I think that kind of pranksterism um, is is a is a part of it, obviously, but you know, and of course, there is a lot of a lot of a lot of that. You can look at it, and you can say, "Well, you're just basically shooting yourself in the foot. You're you're destroying your own career." I like that. <laughs> you, even on yourself. <laughs> yeah, I can, a bit a bit of me likes that. A bit, bit though. A bit of me likes that. I mean, listen, I love the fact. I mean, like you, I've done pretty well for myself in in the business, and I'm very fortunate. And I don't underestimate how. Privileged again, I am to be able to say that mm. I make a very good living from what I do by essentially being quite selfish. Um, and I don't know how I've kind of arrived at that point. I wonder if Tom York asked himself the same question, you know, because they seem to be a band that have willfully kind of confronted expectations all the way along. But at a much lower level, I find myself in a similar position. Um, I would just like to say at this point, not at a much lower level. Well, I mean, in terms of in terms of public awareness. Yeah. I mean, obviously, everyone knows Radiohead. Very few people will not. But but in terms of what I've done, it's been a similar kind of approach to my career. My last album was my last solo album was almost entirely electronic, mm. which a lot of people took. Is that I, Future Bites? Future yeah. Bites, yeah. And a lot of people took that as a fuck you. And it would have been a fuck you if it wasn't for the fact that I loved the record. I loved making it and I was completely invested in it stylistically. It wasn't like, I think sometimes people think I sit down and say, right, what can I do that's really going to piss off my fans? Pop music. And I don't. <laughs> and I, don't. I really don't. I grew up loving pop. Mm. You know, some of the first music I ever loved was ABBA, Donna Summer, the Bee Gees. I fell in love with pop long before I fell in love with, fell in love with conceptual rock music. Or the new wave of British heavy metal, which is the first music I really identified with. That shows you how old I am. Just the first music I ever identified with when I went to secondary school. I remember buying the first Maiden album, Saxon's Wheels of Steel. And I loved that music and I identified with it. But long before that, my parents had got me listening to pure pop. And I love pure, great, you know, great pop for me is just as elevated as conceptual rock music. In my mind. Mm. And I've never understood that kind of snobbism that some rock fans have towards pop. But, I, but at the same time, I recognise that in my demographic, that attitude does prevail. So if I do make an electronic pop record, as I did with my last record, it's going to upset people. But, and part of me is kind of enjoying that it upsets people. But at the same time, I completely believe in the record. I'm completely invested in it. So it's not like that Lou Reed thing where he just goes off and deliberately does something to us. I'm not, I'm honestly not doing that. But I do love those gestures. I love those gestures. Bowie was doing them all the time in his career, you know. And Bowie, I think in many respects is, is and always will be the coolest rock star, the coolest pop star we have ever had and will ever have. Um, just because so many people cite him as a seminal influence. He was in the mainstream, but he was also in the world of, you know, high art, conceptual art. He seemed to be able to span all of these different worlds. He seemed to be able to make people believe in whatever he did, um, that he was doing it with integrity, because I think he was. I think he genuinely was a very curious soul. And, that, and he had no kind of boundaries or snobbishness about doing a piece of pure pop or going off and doing a collaboration with William Burroughs or you know, whoever, or Andy Warhol or whoever. And I think that is something that's always appealed to me. So I've always kicked against this notion. So this is a long way. We're coming r- circling it's right back. It's fine. <laughs> We're circling right back to, this is why I kick against slightly this idea of, uh, that I have this, re- there's this reductive version of me, the king of prog rock. Yeah, I do. It's very flattering, don't get me wrong. And I do do a lot of progressive rock, I do. But it doesn't, to, in my mind, it doesn't define me. And I will take great pleasure in upsetting anyone that thinks that I should just churn out more, for want of a better expression, progressive rock. Mm. 
It's one of the most difficult things to come to terms with, I think, as an artist. You're an artist, you're, so you're supposed to have integrity. You are bearing your soul. How does that tie into the idea of selling yourself? That inherent paradox in you have to be able to sell yourself in order to continue to do what you do. Hey, quick one. Would you like to start a business, scale a business? create multiple streams of income, get better financial education and knowledge, build a personal brand, monetize social media, work from home, create a side hustle. If you'd like any of that, go join my members area, rob.team. Cost you less than a large coffee, one third of the price of Netflix. You can cancel any time with no contract. Learn, earn, invest, build multiple streams of recurring income, digital assets, quicker, easier and cheaper, Zoom masterclasses, live event meetups, Ask Me Anything Lives, exclusive content that we can't put on YouTube because it's too controversial. It's all at rob.team for less than a large coffee. Go join now at rob.team. Something you said before, which really excited me before we even went live was this notion of music versus entertainment because I've not really ever thought of it like that because I'm just a fan of music I'm not in the industry so I'm a voyeur rather mm. than the porn star not actually in it and so I have a probably less educated view than you and a non-musical view but I also have a when I get fanny about something I really I'm a proper mm. fan about it so Muse and Coldplay two bands I really loved when they broke through Showbiz, really great rock al album. Like that was like how I, how I thought Radiohead would continue and didn't. And you know the the early Coldplay won maybe two albums, and then they became a stadium pop band for me. And you said there's the music industry and the entertainment industry, and I guess people would think I don't know Nine Inch Nails early might be music, but Simon Cowell pop band might be entertainment. But what about later Muse and Coldplay? Where do they go on the music entertainment scale? So obviously with everything, there is a gray area. Obviously there is. Now, we mentioned Elton John, for example, earlier on. Now, Elton John has made some of the great, for me, some of the greatest, uh, you know, rock music of all time, rock or pop music, if you want to define him as a rock artist, certainly one of the greatest pop artists of all time. But I think one of the reasons he's been able to sustain such a long career is he's also been very good at adapting with the times. And associating himself. And I think Bowie was good at that too. Madonna is a great example. Ed Sheeran Ma does it a lot, now, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think they're very good at identifying who to surround themselves with at any given moment in time. So there's an element of that, certainly in the career of Elton, certainly in the career of Madonna. Madonna was very good at identifying who was the current big pop producer, who was at the cutting edge of making pop records at any given time. Um, and then bringing them in to be the production team on a new record. Mm. Bjork did a bit of that too. You know, Michael so Jackson, I think, did a lot of my, that. Yeah. yeah. So the, these people, I think, are very canny in the sense that they recognise that they're always the same, but if they change the scenery but around them... and Coldplay aren't the same. I no. mean, the drumming is... Duh, duh, duh. So, yeah. no. Coldplay and music... So I think... I, I, I've never met the guy, so I can't say, but I think... Chris Martin is an example of someone who really loves to be at the centre of um, the universe. He is in love. I mean, you only have to look at his choice of, you know, ex-wife. You know, he, he married a Hollywood superstar. I think he's in love with the idea of being a star, being a celebrity, being an icon. And I get that. You know, again, I grew up with Prince and he was my idol and he was, there was none more sort of cool than Prince and, and you know, in the public eye than Prince at the time. I do get that. And I think he allows that to, because the last album with the collaborations with BTS and all those things, it, to me, it felt very cynical and a very cynical attempt to regain some ground in terms of being a, at the very peak of the pop industry. Whereas I feel Tom York couldn't give a shit. And there was a time, remember, when Coldplay and Radiohead were kind of a similar kind of, in terms of coolness and... Mm. You know, they weren't dissimilar musically even, but clearly they had very different um, aspirations at the end of the day. And I think you can hear that in the music. But then, if, but then even the previous Coldplay album, I think, what was it called? Everyday, 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 Life. Everyday Life, yeah. 
That was his attempt, I think, to make something that would be seen as his great artistic statement. Unfortunately, even that sounded a bit contrived, <laughs> like that was why he was doing it. And I think there's a pro he seems to be now stuck in this kind of, and again, I've never met the guy, and I'm, I'm, this is all supposition. And I have a lot of respect for him, by the way. I think he's got an incredible, written some amazing songs. But there seems to be this constant pull in his, in his mind. Does he want to be seen as this great artiste, Tom York, or does he want to be Ed Sheeran? And I don't think you can, it's a hard thing to pull off to be both. And I, I think I can probably count on fingers of one hand the people that have pulled that off. Mm. Elton might be one of the few. Um, and even then, I don't think anyone would argue that Elton has produced the quality of work that he did in the first 10 years of his career. That, even he, I'm sure, would admit that was his, you know, his imperial phase. So the, Prince is another example. In the 80s, Prince was, just seemed to be doing whatever he wanted and completely reshaping pop music in his image in the way the Beatles did in the 60s, when you have so much power and you have the world's attention on you that you can almost shape the future of pop music which, with, with, with whatever you do. That's, that sounds scary. Yeah. I would say B Beatles in the 60s, Bowie in the 70s, Elton John maybe to an extent. They're so, they're so u ubiquitous. They're so power they have so much attention on them. Prince in the 80s that they're able to actually influence the future of pop. Kanye West, to an extent, in, in this century, I think, has had a little bit of that. Such an icon beyond just the music industry that they're able to shape not only people's perception of pop, but also fashion and other things that go along with pop. I wonder if it will, it will ever be possible for someone to have that power again in the music industry because music has slipped down the list of things that matter to young people. Um, when I was growing up, I'm sure when you were growing up, music was probably the num top of the list of things, the way you defined your personality mm. as distinct. Express yourself to others. And as distinct from your parents. Yeah. So the first thing you would do to make yourself different to your parents was choose music. Mm. Choose music that they would never listen to. Like for me, it was metal. Yeah. So I grew up listening to my dad's Pink Floyd records and my mum's Donna Summer records and ABBA records. But at some point I was like, okay, now I've discovered metal. Now I'm a different, I'm a different person to, to the way my, I'm different to my parents because I like this music. And for years, for 50 years, I think that was the number one way, whether it was hip hop or, you know, electronic music or metal, extreme metal music or whatever it was. Northern Soul, whatever it was, it was the number one way that kids, because when I went to high school, it was, the, it was all the specials, it was madness, it was the two-time thing. That was what kids were really into. And parents didn't get that, you know. So I don't know if that's true anymore. I think pop music is now something that's part of the landscape of, of growing up, but it's not the number one thing. It's more likely to be something to do with social media. And because of that, I think no one is really paying as enough attention to what pop musicians are doing to really care if they're confronting their expectations or moving music forward. So music in that sense has become more about what's familiar, not what might have been unfamiliar when the Beatles released Strawberry Fields or when Bowie came out with Ziggy or when Prince came out with Sign of the Times. And that obviously makes me a bit sad because I grew up believing in the power of music to, to be able to do that, to change the way people thought about the world, whether it's through lyrics or music or the way music was presented. And that's been a tough thing because I've seen that change during my career. I started in the professional music industry in 1992, 30 years ago, when it was still possible. I mean, this is in the slipstream of the whole grunge movement. Mm -hmm. And Nirvana, no question, were changing everything. They were changing the way people thought about rock music. They were changing the way people thought about how they dressed. Yeah. Movies were being made, you know, that were influenced by slacker or grunge, that aesthetic. And that's the last time I really think rock music had that power. Uh, I can't think of any time since then where rock, maybe when Oasis were at their peak, it had that kind of cultural impact. But then even then, only really in the UK, not internationally. 
So one of my questions was, how has the music industry changed in the 30 years you've been in? So maybe we'll tap into that later. We've got one thing that's outstanding in what we've been talking about, and then I'll move on to question two. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first time. I did say we could get yeah, into this. Yeah, no, yeah. So I'm only joking. Yeah. Um, I used to think that bands that sold out, i.e. became mainstream stadium bands, as a hardcore, maybe slightly one of those snobby music fans, I will admit that, I used to think that was selling out. And then when I became an entrepreneur and helped a lot of other people do that, and I now have this, which I believe is a piece of art, a podcast is a piece of art, I am acutely aware of what my audience also wants or need. And I have to be acutely aware of what will work on social media. Sometimes I can do a little bit of a fuck you to social media by like, I don't care if this goes viral or not. I'm just doing this because I want to. But if we don't get out there, I don't see this art as the true expression of its art because it's not being seen. So I kind of like, you know, everything dies in a vacuum. Okay. So I, I and because I've got this old, like, I'm a bit of a snobby music fan mm. um, versus this, I've definitely not sold out, but I have commercialized myself as a, an entrepreneur, which mm. is mm. what we do. Mm. So I now look at bands like Coldplay and Muse, I just, just because we've been using those examples, there are others, and I actually look at them and go, fair play. You know, you had a chance to go big and travel the world and meet all these cultures and, I mean, play a stadium full of 100,000 people and give people what they want and entertain them. Fair play, whereas I'd have been disgusted at say, that me saying that. You know, the, the thought of Radiohead never playing Creep because that's what everyone wanted them to play. I just loved that. Right. Um, but now I'd be like, the fans want Creep. So play them Creep or surprise them on a double encore yeah. and play Creep. Yeah, see, I'm definitely in the former camera <laughs> still, yeah. But what do you think about that paradox? It, well, that's the word, isn't it? It is, it is a complete contradiction in terms of, it's It's one of the... It's one of the most difficult things to come to, come to terms with, I think, as an artist, a pop musician, rock musician, whatever it is, is that you do constantly walk this kind of impossible tightrope, which is you're an artist, you're, so you're supposed to have integrity. And I think this is where it maybe is different to a lot of other industries, and, and maybe there isn't a parallel in terms of what, you know, the industry you're involved in. Um, in the, the, one of the things about pop music is one of the myths that grew up around pop music was that you are bearing your soul when you create something. And a lot of artists do, to be fair. They really do. So how does that, how does that tie into the idea of selling yourself? Now, there are many artists through history, some very famous, that have clearly never come to terms with that, that paradox, to use your word. I don't think Kurt Cobain ever came to terms with that paradox. Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys almost destroyed him. Um, there are other examples. Sid Barrett, the, 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 the guy who formed Pink Floyd, lasted one album before he completely burned out, never came to terms with that inherent paradox in you have to be able to sell yourself in order to continue to do what you do. And what you do, therefore, how can it be completely divorced from the idea in the back of your mind, whether subliminally or subconsciously or consciously, that you have to appeal to enough people to make it so you can do this again in two years? And that is, of course, it's always in the back of my mind. But here's the thing. I've come to realize over the years, by trial and error, that actually... The records that do the best for me and the ones that seem to have given me my career are the ones where I don't think about my audience. And I think I'm very fortunate in that respect. Um, the few times, my, my very first band, the band I got some, my first record deal with was a band called No Man. And we made quite commercial and quite at that time, quite contemporary sounding pop, electronic pop music. And we were getting unbelievable. I mean, we got signed because we got single of the week in the, some, one of the big newspapers at the time, Melody Maker it was called. And it was a big thing in those days. If you, if you were an unsigned band and you got single of the week in Melody Maker, you guarantee all the record companies would be knocking on your door the following week. And they were. 
And we chose to sign to a label called One Little Indian at the time. They had Bjork and The Shaman and they were doing really, they were, they were the hip label. We chose to go with them and we were getting unbelievable reviews, but nobody was buying the records. We couldn't translate that into an audience. In the meantime, for fun in my studio, because I was developing my own little home studio, I was doing these what I call pastiches of old psychedelic and progressive rock under the name Porcupine Tree, just for fun, thinking no fuck has ever gone on here, this old shit, <laughs> and sending out a few tapes to a few people. And then Mark Radcliffe on Radio 1 started playing this one song every night on his Radio 1 show. Which one was that? Radioactive Toy. Mm. And suddenly, overnight almost, this thing that I thought was a joke in the best possible sense of the word. I mean, I loved it, don't get me wrong but something that was completely uh, an anachronism, out of time, no one's going to want to hear this, completely leapfrogged over this thing that was supposed to be giving me my big pop career, which was getting all the money pumped into it, getting all of the, you know, all the, the cool remixes were working on our stuff. Nobody was buying the records, and yet we were getting amazing press. Press were falling over themselves to give us these superlatives. And Porcupine Tree, which is this uncool thing that kind of you know was a reference back to the time to the 60s and 70s and here's another thing there's nothing more passe than what was cool 10 years before i think it takes about 20 years so i'm doing this in the late 80s so music from the 70s was like the uncoolest thing you could possibly imagine in the 80s in the 90s it began to be rehabilitated partly through bands like radiohead obviously referencing back to conceptual rock. But in the 80s, you couldn't get arrested doing that, except there were actually a lot of fans that wanted to hear that. They didn't care about what was fashionable. And I started to, I got a little record deal. I started to sell records and I started to get to the point where I had to put a band together for this pretend band. After two albums, I put a band together because Porcupine Tree had been this kind of imaginary band where I just played everything myself. And it became almost this accidental career when it was supposed to be this other thing that was getting all the plaudits that was supposed to give me, give me my career. So it taught me a lesson that actually when you don't care, you're not really thinking, you're not, you're not necessarily aware that what you're doing is, has an audience or not. These are the things that are actually going to put, ironically, more likely to give you a career. And so this pattern is repeated throughout my career. The more willfully uncommercial I think something is, the more it seems to have created a career for me. My last album, the pop album, it didn't do actually as well as the previous record, um, even though it was much more commercial. And the one before was called? The, the one before, the, so the Future Bites, the, which, which was a much more pop, or it had Elton John on it, mm. Nile Rodgers did a remix, it was, had everything, everything was right about it in terms of, I mean, it came out in COVID, which was a bit of an unknown, mm. obviously. It did well, don't get me wrong, it did well, but it, did, it, it didn't do as well as the previous record, which had been this really heavy conceptual prog rock record. So And that one's called? Hand Cannot Erase. Yeah. Actually, there was one album in between that was kind of a transitional, but... But you take my point, is that it, it, seems to be, it seems to be a pattern in my career that the more uncommercial I think, the, more, the less I think in terms of, oh, that could get played on the radio or, oh, that could do well, you know, um, the less successful it's been. And the more I've thought to myself, fucking hell, this is really self-indulgent, no one's going to buy this. Those are the ones that have got me, the, got me to where I am. And it goes right back to those early days when Porcupine Tree was just this little self-indulgent bedroom product, project, project that was something I did in my spare time from the band that was supposed to give, be giving me the big pop career. Fascinating. It taught me a lesson. Yeah. So while I completely recognise that for most people it might work completely the other way, it's always seemed to be the other way for me. Mm. And I guess I should, you know, and part of me is obviously very grateful for that. Yeah. So has writing progressive music cost you millions of album sales and millions of pounds? Yeah, probably. Probably it has, yeah. 
But then I say that with the caveat that I don't think I would, I may not have been very good at doing anything else. So, you know, again, I have made some more commercial, I've made more pop orientated records because I love pop too. They haven't tended to be the ones that have done well. So I have to probably acknowledge to myself that perhaps I'm not as good at doing that as I am at doing the, the, the more progressive, the more, what, I, what I prefer to call the more conceptual mm. rock music. I seem to be better at doing that perhaps. Or let's just say this, I think I stand out more yeah. when I do that. It's not that I'm bad at doing the more direct pop or electronic music, but perhaps I'm competing in a much larger field there where it's harder for me to stand out. I stand out when I do progressive rock. I seem to be very good at it, um, apparently. So um, has it cost me millions of sales? Of Yes, because that kind of music has always had a problem in its relationship with the mainstream, partly because it is about the, al the idea of the album as a continuum, as a musical journey, as something you expect your listener to sit down and listen to from beginning to end without interruption. Dark Side of the Moon being the, the poster child for that idea. 45 minute mu piece of music. How do you sell quote unquote progressive music in three minutes? And of course, the, the music business has always been and no, no Could time it not be progressive to figure that out? Well, <laughs> is that a double paradox? You're, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love, you're, you, sorry, go on out to that. I, I love that idea. I love yeah. that idea that perhaps, well, and perhaps there are people that have, you know, because if you, if you think of songs like Paranoid Android well, by Tom York, he thinks one of his greatest achievements, I think, is getting a five minute song on the radio. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Parano Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm. Bohemian Rhapsody is one of the most ridiculously avant garde, experimental, ambitious pieces of pop music to ever get to number one in the charts. Not only did it get to number one, it got to number one for like a million weeks and it's now one of the best <laughs> sellings. You know, so of course it is possible. Mm. Is it still possible now in 2022? I would love to be proved wrong, but I don't think so. Mm. Because I just, I think the, the, the attention of people, like I said, it's so fractalized now. About, you know, again, like coming back to this point that everyone was looking, what are Queen gonna do next? What are Radiohead gonna do next? What are the Beatles going to do next? People just don't think like that anymore. Now maybe they do with some, maybe they do with some urban artists, but they certainly don't with rock artists. There isn't that allegiance. Oh, there is, but the fan base is, is you know smaller and smaller in terms of that kind of allegiance to a particular artist. So in terms of broad, in broader terms, the way the media and the mainstream look at bands now, they're no longer interested in oh, what are they going to do next. And part of the reason, another part of the reason for that is just the proliferation of content now. Mm. And I use the word content advisedly because that's the word most of the industry uses now. We no longer make music, we create content for, which is a horrible and ugly I idea. Say, I bet you hate that. It's, I hate it. Of course I do. But I also have to acknowledge that it's, that it's largely true. That but I mean, they call porn on OnlyFans content now. So you've got music and porn all called content. And films, movies. Movies now are content for streaming services like Netflix. That's what movies are wow. or TV shows. So What's the word for that? Is that called homogenization? Is probably. That, yeah. Probably, yeah. But it, but Go on, it, tell us how you feel about that. Well, obviously to me, that whole, that whole idea is incredibly ugly. The idea that what I do is content for Spotify or content for, you know, Tidal or whatever it is. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge to myself that that is, that is largely true. And so coming back to my original point, the incredible proliferation, there are more people now making music than at any other time in history, partly because it's so easy. Buy a laptop, you get GarageBand on your Apple Mac, you can go in there, you can load up some loops, you can record yourself rapping or whatever through the speaker. You can, and there are songs that have been hits that have been recorded in, in, in that way. Because actually the quality is phenomenal. You know, when I started in the industry to make a pop record, you had to, you had to go into a thousand pound a day recording studio for a month. To do that, you had to have a record deal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So now there are more people making music than at any other time in, in history. I think Spotify, I don't know the exact figures. I'm off the top of my head. I think it's something like Spotify have 50,000 new songs added every day. It's ridiculous. You have people's attention. For if you announce a new record now, 
you have people's attention for about a day. Wow. I would say about a day, conservatively about a day. Um, if you're an artist like, you know, Porcupine Tree, for example, we came back with our new record with big announcement when we came back. Yeah, the band are back after 10 years. And everyone got really excited for about a day. <laughs> and actually, I'm what, still excited, by the way. Okay, so. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I lasted a week. <laughs> yeah. But largely speaking, there was a peak. Of course, there is a peak. And I'm sure you must find this in, your, in whatever industry you're involved in. Yeah. You ha- when you come out with something, you have an incredible engagement for a very relatively short period of time. And that period of time seems to be getting shorter and shorter, certainly with, with, in my industry too. What we should have done is we should have dropped the album that day, which is, of course, what a lot of the urban artists do. A lot of the, like Beyonce, she just released her new album. She dropped it at like a few days' notice. There was no pre-release video, as far as I know. I might be wrong about this, but certainly a lot of urban artists are doing this, whether it's Drake. I think Taylor Swift released two albums during lockdown at like a day's notice. A lot of these artists, they literally release their album. And they say, I've made a new record. Here it is. Now that is very different to the way I was always told you make, you you create an album campaign. Album campaign, you release a single three months before, you release another single two months later, you release another single a month later, and then you release a single the day your album comes out. It doesn't work anymore. For a rock artist like me, or Porcupine Tree, it doesn't work anymore. What happens is you announce, Porcupine Tree, we're back. We're coming out with a new album incredible engagement. Everybody rushes to hear the new song. They really like it. They go and pre-order the album. A month later, you release, an- here's another song from the new album. 50% if you're lucky. Another single, a few weeks later, 10% if you're lucky. And the reason is, of course, that the fan base have already pre-ordered the album. They're just waiting for it now. And everyone else They've been bombarded with the pre-release hype of another 150 albums in the time between you. So that constant bombardment of artists releasing new albums, trying to get your attention. And this is why I think, you know, it's hard for people. I mean, I'm in my 50s now. It's hard, you know, that expression, teaching your grandma to suck eggs. You know, I'm old school, but I've had to adapt to try and think of ways to promote records out of the box. Um, because clearly the old approach doesn't work anymore. And I see it every day, My friends of mine's bands, they're still doing the old model. We're gonna release a big song three months before and build up to the album. It d- build up is the wrong word. It doesn't, it dwindles. The engagement gradually dwindles. And I think that's why the urban artists have really adopted that kind of approach. Um, Here's my new album and it's available now. Go and listen to it now. People are excited at that moment. So give them the music right then. Give it to them right then. But of course, I remember when I was a kid buying records and, and a couple of singles would come out before the album and you'd get really excited and mm. the momentum would build. And then on the day you'd be in the record shop buying the copy as it came into our price records. And of course, that is, that is like something from the steam age now. Mm. So you ask the question, how has the industry changed in my time? And and of course, um, it's changed beyond recognition in a way that most of my generation struggle to adapt to really. A lot of pop music to me sounds like glorified playground chants. They're not even melodies, they're just Mm. playground chants that become memes. And that's why I think very few of the songs of today will prevail in the same way that perhaps the songs from the 70s or even the 80s and 60s prevail. And are there any other ways you've learned to adapt to the changing music world? And let me double this question up. I don't normally ask two questions simultaneously, but we'll try this. I also understand you don't really do much on social media. Well, I personally don't. Yeah, that's, yeah. If I never look at it. That's what I thought, because I've been trying to get you on social media for a while on the show. Sorry, yeah. We're here. So so. I, I, I never look at, so, but now, this is interesting because this, there's a very good reason for that, which comes back, and I don't want to sort of labour the whole thing we talked about at length in the beginning of this interview again. The reason I don't go on social media is because I don't want to know what fans are saying because it's hard to be completely immune from what somebody says. Of course it is. You know, I've often said that one of the things about being on stage, for example, is you can be in a room full of 3,000 people, 
2,999, which are all going, all going absolutely nuts for you, singing along to the words of every single song and clearly having a really great time. And there might be one person that looks like they're having a miserable time. They're not enjoying it. They're yawning. They're bored. They look bored. They, they might be in the front row, the second row, third row, whatever. The whole show at that point, in my mind, becomes just for that fucking person. <laughs> you are. Yeah, why are you not? This is for you now. <laughs> but that's it. This, this is... I As in it, trying to turn them round or just being frustrated by them? I don't know. But I think you must have this too. I mean, you, you know, this is the thing. If 100 people, if 99 of them say they love what you've just done and the one person, that's mm. the one that sticks in your craw. That's the one you cannot get out of your mind. Why is it that I don't have unanimity and everyone doesn't love this? And I think that's human nature to, to always get stuck on those criticisms, the negative things, and to kind of almost, almost, you know, like willfully block out of your consciousness all the positive th things that mm. people were saying. Just remember that one thing, that negative. And that's what I mean about that one person in the audience. The whole show becomes about them at that point. And of course, it should be the opposite. It should be the opposite. And it doesn't, and, but I think that's very natural. And I'm not immune to that. So part of the reason why I don't go on social media is because in the days when I did, you know, one, it's, it's compulsive. You know, when you get into reading comments, on, it becomes a compulsion. You start going back and checking every five minutes. And there might be 20 really positive comments. And then one comment saying, oh, I don't really think this is not as good as the last, you know, it's not as good as the usual stuff. Oh, I don't think, think he's gone off here. What? And they probably wouldn't say it as nicely as that nowadays, would they? <laughs> well, and, and that's the other thing, is that there's a lot of belligerence. Mm. Uh, you know, on, particularly on social media, this, this whole sort of black and white thing, belligerence. You see it on Amazon. The reviews on Amazon tend to be five or one star. Mm. Very little in between. It's either the best thing you've ever heard in your life, or this is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. People talk very much in a kind of polarised, about everything, politics, movies, pornography, whatever it is, the news, they'll talk in very belligerent, polarised terms, in an, and in a way that you would never say that to somebody's face. No. You would never, I would never say that to somebody in somebody's face. If somebody said to me, that, what, what, do you, what do you think of my new album? I might say... I can see what you're doing, but it's not, I didn't, re I didn't really connect with me the way that maps your last album did. But on an Amazon review or a Facebook review or an Instagram review, they'll say it in that way that is so obnoxious, so belligerent, so offensive. And I don't know if people don't realise that a lot of the time the artists do go and read this shit. They do. Of course they do. Um, I know some quite big pop, you know, mega stars that I've worked with. I've remixed their stuff. And even they, people you would think would be way beyond that point, even they, they're on social media every day mm. checking what people are saying about them. Um, and you think, why are you doing You don't have to do that. Even people of the stature, I'm not saying this is one of those people, but even someone like Elton John, mm. you know, those kind of people of that stature, even they go on social media to see what people are saying about them. I learned the lesson early on to not read anything because it doesn't matter how positive 99% of people are, that 1% will ruin your week, will ruin your week. And most of the time, it's just some kid in a basement in, in Ohio. Well, they never have a profile picture because I have loads of them on my lives. Loads of them. Well, you mean people are like Chris? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 90% of them don't really know who you are. They never have a profile picture. Yeah, they're just, like you said, some kid in their pants in a, in a basement. Yeah, who's probably got some issue with the world at large, you know, or some agenda. Yeah. Um, it's not their kind of music anyway. You've made, a, you've made an album that isn't their kind of music. That you didn't go in the... I mean, this is what I mean when I was talking about how I love to constantly change direction and do different things. Of course, part of the bargain there is that I have to understand I am going to disappoint people. I accept that, and I think I said to you semi-facetiously early on, but there is an element of truth to it that I always feel like unless I'm upsetting some people, I'm, prob I'm probably not evolving. And mm. I like the idea that I'm... So, of course, part of the feeling of th that I'm evolving and changing is I'm going to upset some of the older fan base. But I don't really want to read exactly what they're saying because it's, 
It's all about what agenda they have. You don't know what agenda they have. What I'm, pain they're in. Yeah, exactly. I've just made an electronic pop record. They might be one of those fans who came from the death metal tradition to my music, mm. which sounds like you might be one of, you know, that's kind of more you, of a metal More, more come from that direction, yeah. yeah. Can so, I tell you how I found Porcupine Tree? Please I've been do. gagging to do this. Yeah, I please. want to know what you think. <laughs> Come on, then. I Googled bands like Radiohead. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I, 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 can, I'll, I'll be double honest. I was both excited and scared to tell you that. <laughs> well, I love that. You know, I'm a massive, I mean, as you can tell, Tom Yule will be one of the people I would look, to, look up to in terms of the way, and Johnny Greenwood, the way they've conducted their career. Mm. We've been um, trying to get them on the show. I'm hoping to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think it'd be fascinating. But I, to either or both of them, yeah. Um, How does that make you feel that a lot of people's entry into Porcupine Tree might have been Radiohead? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, I'm, I'm, you know. You're listen, not a bit pissed off that they're sort well, of gone beyond prog and you're, because you said you were frustrated earlier. I'm, I'm fr I don't, but I don't blame that for that, them for that. I, mm. I, I, do, I do have a frustration that perhaps. Radiohead got away with a lot of stuff that Porcupine Tree and, and, and myself and my solo career don't seem to have got away with. You but mean I, like Amnesiac? Well, I love Amnesiac. I love it. Pyramid Song, I think, is one of my, mm. my favourite radio. What a song. You know, they get away with the extra... But I think, Sorry, could you explain what get away means? Because I, I So don't really I think... That. So here's the thing. I think Radiohead get away with essentially making very obviously conceptual rock music using a lot of what you might call progressive rock tropes, clever time signatures, um, you know, weighty lyrics about the human condition. I'm saying it in a slightly sarcastic way, but of course I love all that, and so I do that <laughs> too, you know. Um, weighty lyrics about the human condition. Things that the, the, the mainstream media traditionally sometimes, you know, have found to be worthy of taking the piss out of, not embracing. Mm. But Radiohead seems to have got away with it in a sense that they have been completely embraced. When I rationalise it to myself, I say to myself, okay, what's the difference? The difference is that Radiohead came from the tradition of alternative music. They came through the same era as Britpop. They were seen as part of a scene that came from alternative culture. Whereas I was very obvious right from the beginning about my roots. I love Pink Floyd. I love Yes. I love King Crimson. I love all this old uncool... I loved all this uncool music. Radiohead were much cannier than me about that. They, they never said, they still don't admit, as far as I know. Um, you know, and of course that's a simplification. They've obviously got many more influences, but then so have I. So I understand in a way why um, they got away, if you like, with wearing their, their kind of conceptual roots when I didn't, when we didn't. Also, they never... I had, met, I, have a, I had a metal aspect, Pokemon Tree have a metal aspect in, in our music. Um, metal is always something the mainstream media, again, always have mm -hmm. a slightly distant relationship with, you know. Um, so I understand there are reasons for it, but I don't hold it against them. I think they're one of my favorite. I think, you know, I love everything about the way they've conducted their career. Yes, I'm fucking jealous. <laughs> Because, I, for example, the way Johnny Greenwood has transitioned into movie soundtracks, I'd love, you know, I'd love to have his life and his career. And I've never managed to transition into to movies, even though people have called my music over the years cinematic. It's one of the words that gets used mm. more than any other. And I've never had the opportunity to do it. So, yes, I'm frustrated and I'm very jealous. But at the same time, I hold no grudge against them. I think they are one of the greats. So, yes, I'm very... If you found... If, That's how I found Porcupine yeah, Tree. Yeah, so I'm very, and I and I hope I hope you're not alone in the way that you mm. you know. That's a great doorway to work walk through. And I found Opeth through Porcupine Tree. Yeah. So I mean, I, I don't know how people can live not knowing about Blackwater Park. Yeah, amazing record. Like or Porcupine Tree. I say this to Harry all the time. Like I keep trying to get Harry into Porcupine Tree. And the only thing, he likes Porcupine Tree, but he's not yet in love with them. And the reason he isn't is because he hasn't given them yet enough listens. Because I said to Harry, normally, you know, you want to listen to music. So you go to familiar when you want to listen to music. But some bands like Porcupine Tree, like definitely like Blackwater Park from Opeth, you need 10 listens. And I was writing a book. It was 
paradoxically, it was called multiple streams of property income. And I was just somehow, um, what's your 12 minute masterpiece song called? Uh, you've done a few of them. Arriving Somewhere But Not Here. Not that one. Um, Wait, which album? Anesthetize? Yeah, on Anesthetize. Yeah. Song two, I think it is. Fear of a Blank Power yeah, Planet. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Anesthetize, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And it just came on. And I got a chance to listen to it 12 times because I was writing a book. Okay. And I was listening to it in the background. Right. And some music, you have to listen to it 12 times to appreciate it. What do you think about that? I think you're absolutely right. I haven't really asked the question. I've just gone, where? No, no. <laughs> well, you have, you've, you've, raised the, you've raised the question. You've thrown it up into the air yeah, as, a, as a thought. And I would, I would totally agree with your thought. I think that the music... The, and the, this, again, circles back to the conversation we were having about... Uh, you know, what role does music play now in, in 2022? Do people engage with music in the way that you engage with music? And I think the answer is no. So whereas in 1973, somebody might have gone and bought Dark Side of the Moon and gone home and listened to it 20 times before it clicked, somebody might have bought OK Computer in 1996 and gone home and listened to it 20 times you before it clicked. You need to. You need yeah. to. I don't think people do that anymore. Harry. You need to do that. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe, but I think... <laughs> I keep it, nagging him. But I think it's also, you know, listen, no, it doesn't, music doesn't, not everything appeals to everyone. Obviously it doesn't. Um, but I think it's also, there's also an element of it depends, you know, again, I've used this metaphor of walking through the right door. Sometimes I'm very ambivalent about a band until I hear a certain song and then it's like, ah, yeah, I get it. Mm. And then I go back and I rediscover the back catalogue and I'm like... Mm. Okay. There's loads of gems that come out. Now yeah. I get it. Now I, I, I buy into what they're trying to do here. I've had that so many times. I mean, I was quite late on to the, you know, the, getting into Radiohead. Um, but then when I heard things like Pyra Pyramid Song and, and Paranoid Android, I'm like, oh, okay. Mm. There's something really extraordinary going on here. I better go back and, and listen. And of course, then it all fell into place. Did you review in Rainbows? I did for Rolling Stone. Yeah, Stirling. I tried to find it. Yeah. I was fascinated to ask because I, I love that Yeah, me album. too. I gave it five out of five. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Naturally. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask you what your review of that album was because you reviewed it and I couldn't I, find it. It's funny because most of the thrust of that, re of that review, and we're going back to 2009 now, are we? 2010? So it's 10 years, 12 years ago now. Mm. Most of the thrust of that review was a lot of the stuff we're talking about that we should treasure, whatever we think about Radiohead, we should treasure, whether you like this album or you don't, whether you like the fact that they have gone off on this kind of weird trajectory when they could have become the new U2 or whatever, we should treasure them for that because this is what real artists and real creative forces do. They reinvent themselves, they, they confront the expectations of their audience, but they, t they win over a lot of those people because people believe somehow in this notion of integrity. They feel the integrity coming through the music. I always feel that with everything those guys do in a way that I don't perhaps feel it whatever Chris Martin does. <laughs> Bless him. And again, I think Chris Martin is an incredibly talented guy and I've written some amazing stuff. But there's something about way, the way he conducts his career I never completely believe it. I always believe it with Ray. And this is exactly what I wrote in that review. Mm. I said, this album hasn't clicked with me completely. I've only listened to it. But I'm going to give it five out of five because I feel the integrity and I believe in what they're doing. Mm. And I, I love the fact that this band exists and they're doing this right at the centre of the mainstream. We need more people to be doing that. Now, what's happened in the 12 years since, of course, is that less and less artists are able to do that mm. and sustain any kind of profile in the, in, the, in the mainstream to the point, going back to our earlier discussion about name the last time a rock band really broke through to the mainstream. It's incredibly tough now because of the proliferation of music. People listen to a song once, and if it doesn't click yeah, straight away... Doesn't matter. There's 50 other songs that have just been uploaded to Spotify the same day. Um, so it tends to be the more banal, the more immediate. A lot of pop music to me sounds like, and I hear this, 
because a lot of my, my stepchildren sing these songs. A lot of pop music to me sounds like glorified playground chants. They're not even melodies, they're just mm. playground chants that become memes. They become things that the kids chant to each other. And that's why I think very few of the songs I'm using, I'm using inverted, <laughs> the songs of today will prevail in the same way that perhaps the songs from the 70s or even the 80s and 60s prevail, because they, are, they haven't really got melodies. That's why ABBA will prevail forever. Mm. The Beatles will prevail forever. I wonder if a lot of these songs from now will prevail, because a lot of them just seem to be, it's, it's that sort of just hooking somebody in with that kind of playground chant thing. And that's the way it seems to be to, to get people to engage from that very first listen. And that's a trick that I clearly don't have. But I don't know if I want to have, because yeah. coming back to your point that I think it takes, takes a few listens, yeah. Sounds like m maybe there's an opportunity for some disruption somewhere then. Is it at points like this, because culturally we, we need some disruption? Maybe there's a... The music Big. industry, yeah, I think, I think the rock, particularly in the world of rock music, which of course is the, the thing that's most beloved to me, there hasn't been any disruption to use your word, which is why I love, the, I love the title of your podcast. I'm very flattered to be even considered to be one of them. But I, but I think that this is what's been lacking in rock music, this notion of disruption, of... Um, there have, been, there have been people that have, that have tried, you know, there have been a few bands that sort of, you know, that band Royal Blood, mm. you know, um, they had a couple of big, big records, but it didn't seem to proliferate beyond a sort of alternative hipster crowd. It just somehow didn't quite go beyond. I think a lot of the time it's about the one song. The one song can just explode. The, the smells like teen spirit, you know, a song like that. Mm. That song changed rock music. Mm. There's no question. I just got a few little shivers there when you said that. It changed, wow. but it did. It yeah. changed. It didn't only change rock music. It changed the world of cinema. It changed the world of fashion. Oh, and how they managed to time it with doing the video in a yeah. gym with a load of school kids. Exactly. But when you think about it, how much of that was planned and how much of it was just pure serendipity? Yeah, who knows? Probably mostly the latter. Mm. And I think that's partly it, is that sometimes you can't contrive for something. No. It's like this whole thing about Kate Bush is running up that hill now. It's, it's like, <laughs> how could you plan for that? Yeah. You know, you could, ne you could never contrive for something to, like that to happen. Mm. That song, I guess some, the producer of Stranger Things just liked that song and thought, oh, you know, that song might work. And suddenly it's become her biggest hit ever. And those things, I think, are almost, it's almost chaos theory. Mm. You can't. You can't plan for something like that to happen. There's no way Nirvana could have planned. And of course, Kurt Cobain reacted very badly to, to that degree of, of, you know, being thrust into the, the very center, not just of the music industry, but of the whole cultural world, fashion mm. world and everything. Influ you know, the whole grunge aesthetic influencing fashion and movies and literature. And that, but, but it was really... That one song, that one song kicked in the doors and changed everything. Um, and it could, it could be that that one song is just around the corner. Who knows? Mm. It's not going to be by me, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm too old and miserable now. But, but it, I think it needs to, it, you know, t p the pop industry tends to be about, it still is about young, it's about younger people, generally speaking. If you want something to really... Um, to really sort of engage and explode culturally it has to come from the younger generation, I think. Mm. And why maybe, do you think that is? I think, generally speaking, I think the younger demographic still drives. Well, I say that, I think that has changed. That's another thing that's changed. Because, for example, in terms of physical product now, so actually selling CDs and records, it's pretty much only the older generation that still buy records. But the stream, the world of streaming is very much, you know, driven by um, a younger demographic, um, which is why urban music is so dominant now. Mm. Because that is what, here's another question for you. I was, oh. I was sorry, I'm turning the questions again. You, it's all right. When was the last time you were walking in the street or driving in your car and you pulled up alongside another car and you heard something other 
than hip-hop music coming out of the window of that car. Or something other than urban music coming out. Because yeah, I can't not. think of the last time I heard rock music, pop music. I used to hear it all the time when I was a kid, you know, or, or in my 20s, 30s. Nirvana would be blaring out, Metallica mm. would be blaring out, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath. Now, it doesn't matter who they are. Could be a young white kid, could be a middle-aged Jewish guy. doesn't matter who it is, guarantee it'll be hip-hop music coming out. I like hip-hop music, don't get me wrong. But why all pervasive now? So dominant. Mm. What's the answer to my question, by the way? Have you heard someone... No, I was the guy in Lamborghini and Ferrari playing heavy metal, trying to <laughs> rebel against that. When was the last time you, you pulled up alongside someone else playing heavy metal out of their car window? I, I don't even think I ever have. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, I used, to, I used to occasionally, you know, it would be Metallica usually, or yeah, Nirvana, Limp Bizkit, or Guns yeah. N' or Guns yes. Roses. Yeah. I can't think of the... And, and so it doesn't matter... You know, there used to be this thing where um, there would be different musical tribes. Um, and I'm not saying you could look at somebody and kind of guess what musical tribe they, they were in, but there was definitely an element of mm. that. Now, I don't think it depends. It doesn't matter what your cultural background is. Yeah. More often than not, you pull up against, alongside the car, you're walking by, it's always hip-hop. So urban music has become so... Dominant, I think, in the twentieth, in the twenty-first century, mm. so far, so far, perhaps in a way that that I mean, maybe you know, maybe sixty, seventy years ago, um, people were complaining that rock music had done away with big band music. I used to hear Glenn Miller coming out. <laughs> of, now it's all this newfound psychedelic rock music. I don't know. Maybe it's just getting older. Do you think we've become two middle-aged men? That we used to look at 30 years ago and well, go. Well, sadly, we have. You know, even though we probably, I mean, I used to say, you know, I used to look at my dad and say, I'll never become my dad. You know, there's no way I could, of course I have. <laughs> of course yeah. I've become my dad. You know, I listen to what my stepchildren listen to and it's like, that just sounds like banana, you know, it's like a computer wrote that song, which is no different to my dad saying all that time ago, that's not proper music. They should learn to play their instruments. It's exactly the same. Yeah. It's exactly, the we all ultimately become our parents, don't we? <laughs> I've done everything wrong, from the style of music I chose to make, from the way I walked away from a, success, a potentially just about to be huge successful band at their peak, to changing musical direction just when the fans thought they had me figured out. In a sense, my career has been a noble failure. Right. We have got 14 minutes until we hit your extended deadline. Is that going to Not be... the deadline, but the extended deadline. Is that going to work for you? I told you I talked a lot. Yeah, uh, that's all good. Well, what we do is we do a quick fire round. Okay. Um, and we normally finish out on this. Okay. I'm going to try and sneak a few of my longer ones in there. So if you do about a 15 second answer on each one, okay. then we're going to get them all in. Okay, I'll try. All right, great. Are musicians paid fairly? 15 seconds to answer that. Seriously? <laughs> well, it was, it was one of my long ones, but we'd be here for a week. I'm not going anywhere, Stephen. I've got, <laughs> okay. I've got no plans. I, I can't answer if I can't answer. If it, um, it's a very, very difficult question. to. It's not a simple answer to, a question to answer. There's obviously no doubt that music has been devalued by, by streaming and, and by the internet. Um, but the genie is out of the bottle. You can't put him back in now. People expect music to be available for free. There are other ways to monetize music. Touring, merchandise. If you have a fan base, um, you can now, using sites like Bandcamp, you can go direct to your fan base and maximize your income. Of course, we're not paid fairly through things like streaming services. Of course not. Um, that, that must be obvious to anyone, yeah. Would you rather have one million cash in hand or one million more fans? Oh, fans. Absolutely every time. I couldn't give a shit about money. Could not give a shit about money. And I say that from the very privileged position where I've made enough to not have to worry about money. But to me now, I would rather make a thousand new fans than have a million pounds. Do we have true freedom of speech today? 
I think it depends who you are. I'm at a low enough profile that I can pretty much say what I want and get away with it. But I see some people that are much more higher profile that, that, that are victims of cancel culture. So I don't think you can, you, you can't be, you can't be Elton John and say what you want, but you can be Stephen Wilson and say what you want. So be careful what you wish for in terms of profile, I guess, in that sense. What's your favorite song that you've ever written, either solo or in your bands? Oh, Craig. Oh. <sighs> I, it's, really, it's really hard to get it down to just one. Uh, there are, f that sounds arrogant, doesn't it? That sounds like, oh, I've written so many amazing <laughs> songs. Um, every song I've ever written, I have reservations with, obviously, but. But there are three or four that I'm really, really, really proud of. Um, I'm going to be very, very obnoxious and facetious now and say that my favourite songs are always the ones I'm working on at any given time. I'm working on my next solo record now, and I'm incredibly proud right now of the songs I'm about to release next year. Could you name those three or four that you've already done? Well, I really like, there's a song called The Raven that refused to sing the title track of this album. Yes. I, I think that's a, a, I love a that great, song. yeah, it's, a, it's an epic. It's, I'm really proud mm. of, that, of that particular song. Um, uh, so that, that, would be, that would be one. Um, wow. Um, on the Future Bites, my last solo record, there's a song called King Ghost, which I'm really proud of. Um, and uh, let's pick one more for you. Let's pick. I mean, the whole In Absentia record, you, you, you said that was one of your favourites. I'm mm. incredibly proud of that whole record. Um, it's probably the most listenable, would you say, Porcupine Tree album. It's, it's got a really nice balance of accessibility, mm. but without losing any of its... Yeah. Of, uh, so as an album, I would perhaps always say to people, if that was the first mm. time they'd ever heard me, I'd say, go, go listen to that record. Mm. Just a quick random one. Was Drive Home written about how you feel when you're being driven home because you know when I was a kid being driven home by my parents and I half fall asleep in the car and it's dark there's a feeling there that I think everyone at some point can relate to feeling good at points in a car I just randomly wanted to ask I think, that I think interesting because you, you pick up on something that's a very specific sort of um, feeling you had you, you kind of associate with childhood I think I tap into a lot of that in my songs nostalgia for childhood comes up time mm. and time the, the, the image of a train comes up in my song so many times. And I know why. It's because I grew up near to a train station. And when I was going to sleep late at night, I would often hear this kind of hissing sound uh -huh. of trains coming in. And I associate it with childhood and that kind of feeling of just drifting off to sleep, which is kind of mm. in a way it feels like what you're talking about with the driving home, you're kind of dozing off to sleep. You feel very kind of warm and... Comfortable and safe. And Yeah, yeah. exactly. Cocooned in a way. Mm. And I, and I associate the sound of trains with a very similar feeling. So I think my answer to your question is, I think that's in there, but almost subconsciously, it's in all my songs. The actual song itself was based on a, on a kind of ghost story that a friend of mine developed. But yeah, I mean, I'm, that feeling absolutely is in there, yeah. Mm. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? <sighs> the biggest risk I ever took was walking away from Porcupine Tree initially for, for the best part of 12 years. Because everyone said I was mad and I didn't care. I, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to work with different musicians. I wanted to explore different musical styles. And I wanted to make, um, I wanted to be able to hop from genre to genre without being told by my bandmates, you know, we can't do that. We can't do this. And that's all part and parcel of being in a band is you do have to, you have pressure also, not only from the fan base that we talked about, you also have pressure for internally from your other bandmates. You have to find a common ground. I walked away from that for the best part of, well, as I say, we, our last show was 2010 and our next show is gonna be in September. So 12 years, I walked away from that. I think that was pretty brave because we were doing pretty well. Mm. Were your band members a bit upset by that? Yeah. And but they also understood why yeah. I was doing it. Yeah. Had it been brewing for a while? Or did you just wake up one day and go? It was funny because um, I, published a, I published a book earlier this, this year called Limited Edition of One. And the first chapter, I, I, did, I just didn't want to do that linear thing of I was born in 1967. My parents were quantity surveyors. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So the first chapter 
is I'm on stage at the Royal Albert Hall, which was our last ever show, and you're inside my head, and I'm looking out at the crowd, all going mad, and I'm looking at my manager and record company thinking, this is the pinnacle, this is the, we've, we've arrived, we've got the band to sell out the Royal Albert Hall, we could have done three nights, blah, 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 blah. And I'm standing there looking out at the audience saying, okay, I've had enough of this. And it was, and the, the obviously the thing is, it was the complete opposite of what I think everyone expected me to feel. And I, and I felt like, yes, this is an achievement, this is an arrival, but it's also an ending, time to do something else. I am not going to allow myself to get sucked into this machine where we're expected now to, and this goes back to the beginning of our conversation, more of the same, more of the same. Make another album like that two years later, go and tour it for two years. Make another album like that two years. And it's so easy to get tied into that in the music industry. Um, so that answers your question. No, I, 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 didn't, I didn't really acknowledge to myself until that very last show, and I say that in the book, I said until that moment, I'm standing on stage at that last show, I don't think I'd even acknowledged it to myself that I wasn't going to do it anymore. And when you did it, for how long was it never going to happen again before it did happen again? I didn't know. I didn't know. I mean, we were kind of developing material going back to 2013, but I wasn't that excited. I didn't, I didn't really want to commit to doing another album and a tour until lockdown rolled around. And then lockdown, I cancelled two tours during lockdown, two solo tours to promote the Future Bites. And I had big plans. It was going to be a big conceptual multimedia show. I was really disappointed. I cancelled the tour and then suddenly we're all at home for two years. We didn't know it was going to be two years, but we're all at home. Am I going to do? So that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I started a podcast of my own. And I said to the What's guy... What's the podcast called? The podcast is called The Album Years. And it, we just... Yes. We yeah. pick a year and we just... Myself and my buddy Tim Bonas, we just talk about music from that year. Our favourite albums, what, you know, we follow the trajectory of artists' careers through... Anyway, we started a podcast. I wrote a book and I said to the guys in Porcupine Tree, you know what? Let's finish this material off that we've been working on and off. And I, originally I said to them... Maybe we'll just stick it out, hush, hush. We'll, we won't do it at all. Just put out the album on hush, hush. Of course, as soon as the management found out. <laughs> and it's hard to say no. You know, it's hard to say no. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. We can do a massive st- We can do stadiums and arenas this time. And we are, you know. Um, so we are doing um, uh, an arena tour, which we never would have been able to do 10 years ago, strangely. It's amazing how the myth has grown during our absence. Mm. Well, I'm really excited and I will be coming to watch you. Great. I can't wait. Great. Um, we've got like 932 questions left here. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold out in the hope that when you're promoting something big in maybe a couple of few years' time, we might be able to do a round two okay. rather than trying to force them all in Sure, now. I'd be happy to, yeah. So what's your biggest failure, Stephen? In what sense? Or are you going to let me yeah. interpret in 15 seconds. My career. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I do in a way, it's fun, you know, it, one of the strange things is that people often interview me, people like yourself or, or you know, or, or just people I meet, and they look at me as someone that has been very successful in my career, in what I do. You know, I mean, if you look at my Wikipedia page, it says things like six times Grammy nominated, you know, all this stuff, number one. And yet, I don't think I quite managed to achieve what that thing that I imagined when I was 20 years old. I have failed. I have failed to become Prince. <laughs> um, which, of course... <laughs> Which, of course, was inevitable. I don't mean that literally, you know, but I, I have, I have I, in a sense, my career has been a noble failure. But, of course, it's more complicated than that. But it, it, it's not what I imagined, but I'm quite pleased in a way things have worked out anyway, if that makes sense. Do you have a biggest regret? I mean, there, you know, if I could have gone back to the beginning of my career and just been a little bit more careful about how I might have um, 
presented myself early on and avoided the kind of um, what we talked about, the pitfalls of being pigeonholed as a prog rock artist, been a bit more uh, canny about it, um, then maybe it would have presented less obstacles in the sense of getting the music across um, to a mainstream audience. I was very, very clear early on, you know, I said I love all these terminally unhip bands. All the time. I love, love them, you know. And I was very honest in a way that Tom York and Johnny Greenwood were very canny. They never admitted to liking those bands. Um, probably they had a very good, uh, you know, team of people advising them. Don't say you like Pink Floyd. <laughs> I was like, oh, I love Pink Floyd, you know, um, which in 1989, 1990 was not a cool thing to say you liked. Right. You know? So maybe that, that. But I'm pretty pragmatic about my career. I, I, I think things happen for a reason. My wife is very much of the belief that everything happens for a reason. I think everything has happened for a reason and it's all worked out in the end for me. So regret's possibly the wrong word. I understand previously you've said that you sacrifice family for music mm. and now you have a family. So has, has that changed? Well, I mean, when I said that, I really believed it. I didn't think I was ever going to get married and I really didn't think I was ever going to have kids. And then I met my wife. Did you think you wouldn't or did you think you didn't want to? Both. Oh. Both. I had no great compulsion to have children. Um, so I thought, and I was... You know, I was, I think when I said that, I was already in my early 40s. I really believed that. I thought the, the, the ship had sailed, you know, in terms of that, that life for myself. And obviously I'm known as someone that's very prolific. And I always say to people, well, one of the reasons I've made so many records is because I have no family commitments. And, and the truth is that now I have a family, I do have less time. I do, I have slowed down a bit. I'm being a little bit more um, selective in what I release, what I choose to release. It's an album every two or three years rather than three a year now. So that is a change, yeah. Mm. This show is called Disruptors. It used to have the word disruptive in it before we changed it. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Well, I, I mean, I, this is why I was very flattered to be asked. I, I interpreted that as someone that seeks to challenge the prescribed ways you are supposed to go about having a career in a, in a particular field. And looking at your list of guests that you've had in the past, I would say that's true of all of them. So um, I would love to think of myself as being in that tradition, certainly, yeah. Disruptive in the sense to, to um, perhaps change people's perception about how you can go about having a career in a particular profession. I've done everything wrong. You have to understand that I have done, on paper, I have done everything wrong. From the style of music I chose to make, from the way I walked away from a, success, a potentially just about to be huge successful band at their peak, to changing musical direction just when the fans thought they had me figured out. I've done everything wrong, and yet I've actually made a pretty good living. So I don't know how that happens, but that, that to me is, is, is a disruptive element, I suppose. I just want to say I think your music's Fucking amazing. Thank you very and, much. <laughs> and this has been probably one of the highlights of me in doing nearly a thousand episodes no of this way. show. Well, I'm sure you say Absolute. that to all your guests. Harry, do I say that to all my guests? <laughs> you do not. Okay. No, I do not say that. So I just want to say a massive thank you. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Yeah, we could have talked a lot more, I know. But um, like you say, I'm happy to do a follow up here. Yeah. Thank you. And then I would love everybody listening to go down the rabbit hole of Stephen Wilson and Porcupine Tree because I think they're going to have an amazing ride. It is a roller coaster, that rabbit hole. But where should people start, whether it's a live gig you've got coming up or whether they should follow or an album they should start with or all three? Let's do all three. It's always hard because you, it, it, in some ways you need to know the agenda of the person that you're talking to. I would say if you like, like, you like more heavy music, I'd say, yeah, go and pick, check out Fear of a Blank Planet, mm. Porcupine Tree's Fear of a Blank Planet album, or In Absentia. If you like more electronic music, I would say definitely check out my last album, The Future Bites. Um, it, you know, so it really does depend on, on the agenda. But certainly um, In Absentia, Fear of Blank Planet, The Future Bites. Um, if you like more old school progressive rock, The Raven That Refused to Sing. If that's you on the, is the album, that, is that the name of the album as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. it's an And top, the song. Yeah. yeah. It's a very, it's almost an old school 70s progressive rock album. A lot of my fans, that's their favourite because that's what they like. 
There's an album I really love called Insurgentes, which was almost more of a kind of an album influenced by shoegazer music, Cocteau Twins and Slow Dive. And I'm really proud of that one too. So it does depend. And I think that's part of, the, part of what I love about people discovering my music is that you can introduce them to kinds of music they didn't know they liked. Mm. At least I like, that's the idea I like, that, that, that perhaps I can do that. Um, and then what about live shows? So we have a show coming up. We're only doing one show in... One show in each major territory, so one show in Paris, one show in London, and we're playing Wembley Arena on the 11th of November. Um, and that will be the only, we might do some festivals next year in England, but I think that's going to be the only headline show we're wow. going to do. I was just going to make a note, but yeah. I suppose when we, when we 11, finish. 11th of November, I yeah. mean, to every Porcupine Tree fan, surely that's the dream, isn't it? I would like to think so, yeah. <laughs> Will you play some old stuff as well as some yeah, new stuff? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to do the new record, obviously, but we're, yeah. we're doing... This is, again, coming back to the beginning of our conversation. Um, because we don't have any hits, we kind of a liberty to sort of cherry-pick things that we want to play. I mean, obviously, we know there are songs that... Are so, like, we are going to play Anesthetize, for example. Yes. There are certain songs we yeah. know that are fan favourites. Trains we're going to do... Mm. Um, blackest eyes we're going to do yeah. but we're also going to go back and pick some deep cuts from our cat a very American term that I hate that anyway uh, <laughs> deep cuts from some of our albums that perhaps people won't expect us to play in fact one that we never played even at the time from In Absentia funnily enough mm. a song we never played live at the time are you allowed to say which one it is no I want it to be a surprise okay I think I think that's part of the joy of yeah. coming to a show sometimes yeah. you don't know what the band are going to which is yeah. another thing that the internet has robbed us of in a way Everyone goes on set list. Don't yeah. They? Oh, we're going to play that. I used to love going to shows and not knowing. Mm. But isn't it nice? Isn't it nice to know there's a couple in there, but the rest are a surprise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But you yeah. know a couple already, yeah. so I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thought I'd take my chance. Yeah. Right. I think you have to go, Stephen. This has if been that's an okay. absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure too. Yeah. And thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure. So what did you think about the interview? Let me know in the comments. Obviously, I embarrassed myself, but hey, we covered half the questions we could have covered. This was a long conversation. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you want to watch another Disruptors interview with disruptive guests, watch here. And before you go, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.